The USS Nogo, America's Invincible Concrete Battleship, Fort Drum, by none other than the Fat Electrician. Ah yes, El Frale, that time the US military industrial complex decided to play Pimp My Island. Uncle Sam's got a blank check, that's all I can say. Today we're talking about Fort Drum. Yes, I realize that's a military base in New York. No, that's not what we're talking about. There's another Fort Drum. It's guarding the mouth of Manila Bay in the Philippines. It's also referred to as El Frale Island, America's unsinkable concrete battleship, or the USS No-Go. Basically, the US military took a tiny island and turned the entire thing into a gun, and we're going to talk about it. Right. That is such a USA thing to do, though. Like, I can already hear the chanting, USA. USA. I, I can already hear it. It's perfect. After a word from our sponsor, this video is brought to you by Sheath. Okay, here's the deal. They're like normal underwear, except they're better because they have a pouch that you can stick your junk in and then your balls aren't stuck to your thigh. And trust me. I've heard other people definitely be sponsored by this company. They sound legit. Trust me, it's just one of those things you don't know you need it until you need it. And once you have it, you're not going to be able to live without it. Let's yeah. face it, every good thing that's ever happened to you in your entire life would have been a little bit more gooder if you didn't have balls stuck to your thigh the entire time. And I know what you're thinking. What if I don't have balls? That's cool. Were you with people? that did because if you were they probably would have been in a better mood if balls weren't stuck to their thigh the entire time you should buy them these underwear Don't Th this ad read goes so hard like usually i'm just like oh yeah let's rate the ad read no like this this ad just goes hard like instant 10 out of 10 for me don't believe me ask the kangaroos those marsupials have known how awesome pouches are for like 15 million years they've been hoarding the technology but now sheath is here to fix that All penguins too actually don't penguins have like a primordial pouch for their uh eggs and chicks right they also have pouches. What I'm saying is give it a shot. Worst case scenario, you find out you actually do like having balls stuck to your thigh and these underwear aren't for you. And in which case, Sheath has a 30 day, no questions asked money back guarantee <laughs> and you're out nothing. I'm gonna have a link and a discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. This was perfect. I, I don't, I have no other words than this is perfect. Like this is such a, to, as the kids would say, hashtag guy problems, 100% a thing. Oh my God, this, this went so hard. I, 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 no pun intended. I absolutely love this. So why on earth did America turn an island into a giant gun? Well, our story begins in 1898 during the Spanish American war. Why is America at war with Spain? To be honest, I'm kind of blanking out on that right now. Statistically, it's probably because they messed with our boats. So let's go ahead and double check that together. <laughs> Always the boats. Just stop. Stop. Okay. Come on. History literally gives you the playbook. Just stop messing with the boats. It's not hard. How did the Spanish American war start? Mm. The USS Maine mysteriously exploded in a Cuban <laughs> harbor. Believe. <laughs> it's always the boats. Not, just no touchy the boat. The funny, the funny little watercraft. Need to be the Spanish. See, yeah. I was right. It's always the boats every single time. Honestly, at this point, Jordan Peterson needs to go back and rewrite his book because he actually wrote a book called 12 Rules for Life. And the fact that not fucking with America's boats wasn't rule number one seems like an oversight on his part. Anyways, yeah. so America sends a bunch of boats into Manila Bay to fight the Spanish. While they're headed into Manila Bay, they pass this tiny little rock island called El Frale. And on El Frale, there was a bunch of Spanish artillery that basically tried to ambush all the American ships. Mm -hmm. It didn't really work, but it was a super good idea. Fast yeah. forward, America wins. I see your idea. I appreciate the effort. This is our island now. We're, we're going to turn that entire thing into just a steel fortress. It's going to be great. The Spanish-American War takes control of the Philippines. So now with America in charge, they decided that they wanted to be able to defend Manila Bay, and they remembered back to how the Spanish almost had a successful ambush by putting artillery on El Frale, and that's when the Americans in charge said, hey, hear me out. Instead of putting artillery on El Frale, what if we turned El Frale into artillery? So the it's slightly to the left, but honestly, A plus as an idea. No, I, I have I have nothing but respect for this. The engineer was like, okay, here's the plan. We're going to level the entire island perfectly tabletop flat, and then yeah. we're going to build an enormous concrete bunker on top of it with two battleship turrets, each of which having two 12-inch guns on them. So the wow. engineer in charge draws the blueprints up, sends those off to the War Department to get approval, at which point the War Department is like, hold on, let me get this straight. You want to level an entire island, build She's an down. enormous concrete bunker on top of it, and then you want to equip it with two battleship ship turrets, each of which has two 12 inch guns that we're going to have to manufacture in Water Valite Arsenal in New York and ship them all the way to the Philippines. The, the heartbeat of this plan is just the screaming of a bald eagle. That That's all that is. Which the engineer is like, yeah, that's that's exactly what I want to do. And the Pretty war good. department is like, I'll pump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers in yeah. the tracket. 
because we're gonna do 14 inch guns, <laughs> each of which is gonna be shooting 1600 pound shells. If somebody yeah. tries to sneak into Manila Bay, we're literally gonna start shooting cars at them till they go away. So they yeah. start construction in 1909 and it takes them five years to finish. And what they end up with is Fort Drum. It's concrete is anywhere between 25 and 36 feet thick. The Jeez. top deck is completely reinforced with steel, essentially making the entire fortress completely impervious to any weapon that exists at this point in time. That very good distinction in terms of modern warfare we start to get into debates but and at the time this thing is just a brick like this this thing is like you're playing dark souls one and they've got like stone armor or like ha full havel set on right you're just not touching them you're, you're just not <laughs> And the guns on top are 14 inch M1909 guns in a dual turret that was specially manufactured just for Fort Drum and it is the only yeah. place they were ever used. Wow. This turret has armor that is 18 inches thick, virtually making that impervious too. Then just in case being able to shoot cars at people you don't like while being inside of a bunker that makes you impervious to retaliation isn't enough, it also has four six inch guns and two three inch anti-aircraft guns. And inside the bunker, they have six months worth of food, their own power plant and a distillery so that they can make their own clean drinking water. Exactly, yes. No, clean drinking water. GI, clean drinking water. It's all good. What else would you use that for? What else would you use the distillery for? Absolutely not any sort of alcohol because, as, as we all know, that would be frowned upon. You absolutely could not have that on base, on site, anything like that. Even a modern day. Absolutely none of that, none of that happens at all, ever. No, that is a no-no. Basically, it's the world's best doomsday bunker. So it's yeah. completely done. It's like 1914. America has built this incredible weapon. And now, in true American fashion, we're not really going to use it until it's borderline obsolete. And then we're going to give it away to somebody else. So kind of fast yeah. forward through the next 20 years. I mean, there's always army guys stationed there and on hand in case anything happens. But nothing ever does. This almost feels like, what was it? Sabaton Soldier of Heaven, what that was based off of, Alpine Warfare. Well, I guess... I guess yes and no, because that was, as far as I'm aware, a situation where they helmed the Alps, right? But because of because of the area, because of the temperature, because of the climate and geography, that wasn't really ever a theater, but you didn't want somebody to take you by surprise. And absolutely, there's going to be someone in the comment section that's going to enlighten me more you know, on that situation. Absolutely, and I do encourage that. It kind of reminds me, it was just like you, you keep your your personnel stationed there not necessarily because you are expecting something not necessarily because it is a a front of sorts but because just in case you have people that you can mobilize and activate as necessary it's kind of like being stationed on a naval vessel and because of that the army guys that serve there give it the nickname the uss no go considering yeah. it never fucking goes anywhere <laughs> then of course during that same time period world war one happens after world war one america downsizes their military considerably then the great depression happens and because of that pretty much no upgrades or maintenance gets done to fort oh. drum during that entire time so for its first two decades there were some other priorities that needed to happen in that time frame right you had the dust bowl going on you have an entire economic collapse uh you have so many things happening in that very specific time frame it receives pretty Spanish much no upgrades right? it's already becoming obsolete then in 1934 the u.s government comes out and says over the course of the next 10 years between 1934 and 1944 america is going to move towards establishing the philippines as its own sovereign nation so obviously they're also going to turn over fort drum to the philippines and because of that they have even less motivation to do any upgrades to it so none get done then during that 10-year time period world war ii kicks off in 1939 but america's not getting involved we're minding our own business and by minding our own business i mean we're basically funding the entire thing through lend lease but you know <laughs> we're not involved then <laughs> not involved which i mean is is true i mean and that's where alliances get into that and that's where not necessarily proxy wars right but say for instance if you had something like the uk we're going to stay in period just to be safe for you too right in period you have the uk going against well i guess it'd be britain right my map knowledge is awful. I'm going to say the UK, and I apologize if that's wrong. Going against the USSR, the Soviet Union, right? Well, how is the how's the UK? How are they getting their money, right? Oh, well, it's like the US can, you know, send a little dollar to over that way, but we're not involved. We're absolutely not involved. There's no involvement from the US. We are completely neutral in this conflict. We don't want anything to do with it. But sending a few dollar dues their way, right? That kind of thing. And I'm sure there's modern parallels you could draw as well. 
Pearl Harbor happens in 1941, yeah. AKA somebody fucks with our boats. Now we're going to war. Less Boat. than 10 hours after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese show up in the Philippines. They invade. The American forces are not ready and they all get driven down to the Bataan Peninsula, which as you can see is also at the mouth of Manila Bay with Corregidor and Fort Drum. For like mm. the next five months, while American and Filipino forces duke it out with the Japanese on the peninsula, Fort Drum is pretty much shooting at any Japanese vessel that gets anywhere near it. The mm -hmm. Japanese vessels are returning fire at Fort Drum. They're launching air raids, trying to bomb Fort Drum, none of which is work. effective at all. Also no. during this time, the Marines and soldiers stationed at Fort Drum rip all the buildings on top of it off, throw that shit in the ocean. They also <laughs> tear down the 60 foot search tower and get rid of that as well. That way the massive turrets can do a full 360 and be able to shoot in any direction. Then the, is, the, is this in fact the first iteration of improvements to make the first 360 no scope with a cannon. Oh, please tell me. April 9th, 1942, Bataan Falls, and the only thing left is Corregidor, Fort Drum, and two other small coastal forts. For weeks after this, the Japanese shell both Corregidor and Fort Drum with naval gunfire, as well as conduct bombing runs. Fort Drum is pretty much completely impervious to all of it, which infuriates the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Corregidor, on the other hand, is nowhere near as fortified, and they are hurting bad. Because of this, the majority of Corregidor's defenses have been completely destroyed and the only thing defending Corregidor now is Fort Drum. On May 5th, 1942, the Japanese would launch an amphibious attack on Corregidor. Fort Drum would land direct hits on two Japanese landing craft, destroying them completely, infuriating the Japanese even further. Mm. Despite that, it wasn't enough and Corregidor would fall on May 5th. They really hated that fort. They really, really hated that fort. The concrete battleship and the 240 men manning it are now the last holdouts in the Philippines against the Japanese, and it is pissing the Japanese off. Mm -hmm. And in immediate retaliation for them taking out several of the Japanese landing crafts at Corregidor, they begin launching air raids against Fort Drum, and they are, again, completely ineffective. During those air raids... Talk about just just being up armored to the umpteenth degree for the metagame you're fighting in. It's like it's like if you're playing a card game and you just you just have too much toughness or too much base stats for everything else in the metagame. But you can't necessarily do damage, but you just nothing can crack you, right? You kind of just turtle up all game. Or if you're playing an MMO and you're doing a boss fight, you're doing an activity, a dungeon, right? And you just have that much armor and regen that you really just don't have to worry about actually getting you know getting taken down right it is just it, it's an anomaly i will say but man it is talk about just being up armored and effectively future proofed up through world war ii because of that sheer amount of armor that's wild and some of the marines manning the anti-aircraft guns would manage to shoot down a japanese bomber only serving to piss them off even mm -hmm. more at this point general wainwright the man left in charge of american forces in the philippines after general macarthur abandoned his men and fled to australia issued the order that all american forces were to surrender on may 6th at noon at the and so I actually had to have a conversation with my buddy who is Cav Scout and history teacher. I'd have a, like an actual conversation with him on that subject. In the initial, I believe it was the Ghost of Baton video that we were talking about how MacArthur does withdraw from the Pacific theater and goes to Australia. And, uh, you know, was this considered desertion? Was this not desertion? Was this legal? Was this ethical? I mean, I think many, many people can argue ethics. And I've heard from a number of people, MacArthur isn't necessarily the most well-liked not like he's a bad general he just doesn't he's not very well liked i hear he's kind of divisive in that aspect but because as far as i'm aware and have been educated is that his he was to answer directly to the u.s government whether that be the president whether it be the department of defense i think it was the president at this point in time but you know that's the only one he has to answer as long as he can move his theater he can move wherever he wants wherever he needs to wherever he deems is best all he has to do is he has to answer to the president Department of Defense, and that's all he needs to do. So that was very interesting to learn as far as, like, he is the acting, he is the general in this theater, and he withdrew, you know, to Australia, because at that point, a little bit of a safer haven to actually be able to, you know, issue orders from and engage uh, engage uh, the Axis powers from at that point in time in that theater. And, you know, I, I, when I, I, I cite this to showcase, I don't know everything. I love learning stuff. I absolutely do. And if I have something that I don't understand, I absolutely do my best to seek the answer. And I do my best to, in what capacities I can, kind of 
gain knowledge and address it where I can, where is appropriate, and thus that we're back in the Pacific Theater in World War II. Thought it'd be relevant to bring up that. You know, it, it, he did, this was as far as people might argue, maybe ethically, maybe good, maybe not good, but it was a decision that he legally could make, and you know, he brought it up you know, down to Australia, and that was all the justification he needed, because... It's it's not desertion. It's the it's his post. It's his theater, and he deals with his theater in what ways he deems best. So it was rather interesting to learn. At this point, according to the legend, the entire crew of the USS No Go, aka Fort Drum, gets together and they have a conversation and talk about whether or not they want to even follow this order because they think they can go toe to toe with the Japanese forever inside of this concrete monstrosity. So, and I guess that gets into, and this is where well, I'm not military. I'm civilian, right? So when I say X, like a lot of the misconception that, oh, bayonets are a war crime, right? That comes from a, I guess, the civilian perspective. It's up close and personal. Some might deem it barbaric, quote unquote, if you will. And while well, it's not necessarily written out in you know Geneva Conventions or anything like that. So I, I will fully admit that I have a skewed understanding of this. I'm also not a military personnel. I do not have any claim to that. So thus, I am new to a lot of these topics. And there is the whole discussion that gets had where you can follow law, uh, you, you must follow an order unless it's not ethical or not legal. There's some, there's some variation of that in which you have to follow an order, but if it fits certain criteria, you don't have to follow an order. And that gets into the whole argument of, you know, if you don't follow this, it'll be a court martial, but is this, is this uh, order legal? Is it ethical? Right. Does it make sense? That kind of thing. That is decisions for military personnel to really kind of engage in. I, yeah, I can look at it from the outside. Realistically, as a civilian, have no ability to say what anyone in the service, you know, can or can't do. It's very fascinating to me as a subject. I just want to draw that line in the sand of I am a civilian. I do not have full understanding and really don't feel qualified to speak on those points because there are people in the service that go through a lot more than any civilian has to. I, I don't have the same qualifications and standards and expectations of me that military personnel do and have had. Mad respect to military personnel of all branches. Just, just saying. Unfortunately, they would come to the realization that this decision had already been made for them because mm -hmm. at some point the distillery that purifies their drinking water became damaged and without oh. U.S. ships being able to bring them water, they weren't going to be able to hold out. So mm -hmm. given that they have to surrender tomorrow, but they still want to fight, they decide, hey, let's get rid of all this ammunition that we have. And they fire at the Japanese ships nonstop <laughs> as fast as they can for like the next 18 hours straight. And apparently, <laughs> according to legend, it got so hot inside of Fort Drum that it was able to increase the muzzle velocity of the guns and they were able to score more hits on Japanese ships that thought that they were out of range. And they could Whether that's factual or not, that is actually really impressive. Continued to fire non-stop until 11.59 on May 6th when they were finally <laughs> forced to surrender at noon. They then proceeded... It's, it's Jar Jar, we suck them up, we suck them up. <laughs> I don't know why I went meatwad there. To sabotage the guns, the power plant, and flood as much of Fort Drum as they possibly could, making it useless to the Imperial Japanese. At right. the time of their capture, all 240 men were still alive, and only five of them had been injured after weeks of combat. They would then be taken wow. as prisoners by the Imperial Japanese, where the majority of the men would be tortured, starved, and worked to death. And it is believed that less than 30 of the men at Fort Drum returned home after World War II. Fast forward three years, 19. And I think that this, it's kind of strange, actually. Public perception of J uh, Japanese, the, the uh, Imperial Japan in World War II, is, I think it's a really strange era. Because the Pacific Theater, at least in U.S. education, U.S. public education, almost Idaho, all I'm saying, isn't really discussed. And it's, yes, we go over the European theater, we go over Blitzkrieg, Kristallnacht, we go over the events that lead up to World War II, we go over some of the events in World War II, we, of course, go over... Uh, Omaha Beach, right? D-Day. We go into the Allied powers moving into Europe and we go into uh, <laughs> Toothbrush man, Mustache Man. <laughs> Thanks, YouTube. We go into his folly in regards to installing the wrong people in the wrong places and, you know, him attempting to reach, was it reach, was it reach Moscow uh, before winter sets in? Or was that World War One? I? I can't remember. There's a meme in there somewhere. I think it's the World War One equivalent, uh, World War One version of that. But you know, you have the German military commencing into the USSR and the Soviet Union is just like, nah, we're just <laughs> going to burn all this <laughs> a series of tactical blunders, which eventually lead into, you know, uh, the fall of the Third Reich. And then you get into, oh, well, the Pacific Theater kind of happened. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, we have 
uh, uh, Pearl Harbor that happens. We have these engagements here, and and the war is declared over uh, after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I, I I I'm not kidding when I tell you that people in Idaho that have taken Japanese as a class legitimately pronounced Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that that just kind of set me off in a very specific way. <laughs> I'm not very good at speaking Japanese. I try my best, though, is all I'm going to say, and trying is what matters. But I digress. It's The Pacific Theater is vastly undertaught, in my opinion. And there's a lot of engagements and a lot of interactions, specifically like this, right, with Force Drum, that don't really... They don't really make it into, at least what I remember of the Pacific theater in my education. And so I love when fat electrician, love when historians bring all these things up and are just, they're fascinating. And to understand that the, the <laughs> Imperial Japan in World War II was not joking around. Let's look at Shiro Ishii and Unit 731 if you want an example of just how absolutely just off the rails it could get. And that leads into the ethical debate of Shiro Ishii being exonerated for 731 by providing all that information over to, I believe it was the US, I don't know which agents, it might have been the CIA, but I can't remember specifically. Uh, all of those people tortured, all of those people tested upon, all of those lives lost, and the man that orchestrated it being exonerated in exchange for his research findings. That starts getting to a little bit of a moral debate. But uh, no, the Pacific Theater is wild and i think japan is often overlooked uh, for how just absolutely just tenacious they were in world war ii 45 america is now winning the war in the pacific and they have returned to the philippines to reclaim them from the japanese at this point fort drum is believed to be completely inoperable and nobody has seen anything that would suggest otherwise mm -hmm. until in april of 1945 an american pt boat would get a little bit too close and japanese machine guns would begin firing upon him wow. from fort drum this intel gets sent up the chain of command at which point nobody really knows what's happening maybe they're trying to restore fort drum and use it maybe there's just a bunch of japanese soldiers that are being barracks there who knows Either way, Uncle Sam says, you know what? That's mine and I'm going to need it back. <laughs> so at first they try to bomb it with planes. Obviously that's not going to work. It didn't work when the Japanese did it. I don't know why they thought it would work now. Then they send out a cruiser to shell it with naval gunfire. Again, obviously it doesn't work. At which point shit proceeds to get out of hand pretty quick. Basically the chain of command didn't really know what to do. So they're like, hear me out. Let's just give the blueprints for Fort Drum to an entire platoon of Army Combat Engineers, a.k.a. Oh, no. the Demolition Men, and tell them to get rid of it, and the sooner they do, the sooner we all get to go home. So the engineer... It's genius. <laughs> it's so genius. Like, I love it. Like, oh my god. There are just certain people that if you tell them, look, you get to go home after you do this, regardless of how complex the project is, they'll get it done. Might not be... It might not be to your specifications. It might not be done the way you want it to be. It might be done in a way that, oh my God, like this is never actually going to be the same again, but it'll get done. I assure you, it'll get done to, to the letter. Here's take the blueprints. They go come up with a plan. I don't really know how long it took them. I presume about the same amount of time it takes them to smoke a cigarette. That's probably not a coincidence. They come back to the chain of command. They're like, okay, here's what I need. All right, we're going to need an entire company of infantry, a thousand gallons of gasoline, 2,000 gallons of diesel, all the incendiary and white phosphorus grenades you can find, a 30 minute fuse, and a camera guy because you're going to want to get this shit on video. Yeah. And apparently the chain of command is like, okay, so a couple days later, that I, 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 anyone that could just come back after a cigarette break and say that, you know, they're cooking. No pun intended. They're, they're cooking. Get, give that man a blank check. Later, April, Friday the 13th, 1945, the U.S. forces launch Drum D Day. Two American ships pull up, drop landing ramps onto Fort Drum, and all the infantry and combat engineers run out to secure the deck, at which point they start taking fire from one of the six inch guns. They right. all return fire, including the ships, until that six inch gun stops. Then mm -hmm. they secure the entire deck, and the combat engineers get to work. The engineers then run a hose up onto Fort Drum and begin pumping 3,000 <laughs> gallons of gasoline and diesel into the air vent of Fort Drum. They then proceed to put 600 pounds of TNT, a bunch of white phosphorus and incendiary grenades on top of it, rig it up to a 30 minute fuse, light it and fucking run. They hop I feel like how this would be done in a movie or a game. It's, it's the General Shepard, Modern Warfare 2, throws the cigar on, on Ghost. <laughs> 
that that's the vibe I'm getting from this. Just like that was our base. Flicks the cigar. <laughs> Back in the boats, they sailed a safe distance away, and then they waited and they watched, and this is what they saw. I love it. That explosion was so powerful that it shot the 2,000 pound hatch on top of Fort Drum 300 feet into the air. Wow. And if you watch the video a little bit closer, you can actually see the hatch punch through the top of the mushroom cloud before falling back into the smoke. That's impressive, actually. The diesel fire inside of Fort Drum then proceeded to burn for five days straight, officially putting an end to any hopes of ever restoring <laughs> it to its former glory. In yeah. the coming months, American and Filipino forces would reclaim the Philippines, Japan would end up surrendering, World War II would come to a close, and the next year, on July 4th, 1946, the Philippines would gain their independence, becoming their own sovereign nation, and thus taking control of Fort Drum. Where it still sits at the mouth of Manila Bay, pretty much in the same condition that America left it, serving as a powerful reminder to not mess with America's boats or anything that even kind of sort of looks like a boat for that matter, okay? Yeah. Just don't. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. This was amazing. I didn't know I needed this today. This was... I feel like I can give all the examples in the world and I'm still going to wake up tomorrow to news that somebody touched the boats. So about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But once more for those in the back, in case you uh, you know, maybe didn't hear about that. Don't touch the US's boats. This is the, there is literally a, a playbook, a cheat sheet. It's called history. Stop touching the boats. <laughs> it's not hard. This was absolutely amazing and got off the rails so quick. Oh, my God. If this is your first interaction with the Fat Electrician through me, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and check out the Fat Electrician. Down in the description, you will see this original video as well as his channel down there. And if you didn't know, he also has his other channel, The Fat Files. You should definitely go check that out because they're absolutely just, just off the rails stuff over there. It's still a growing channel, absolutely. And he's made a lot of great, cool progress with it. I'm a huge huge fan of uh, everything he puts out just seems like a super interesting dude i'm not paid i'm not affiliated right i just think that he's a super interesting dude super cool dude super personable and just an overall pleasure to just watch and really just kind of converse with in this capacity um very awesome person definitely go check the fat electrician and the fat files out if you have not and i guess uh what are your thoughts did you know about the uss no good did you know about fort drum before this did you not was this your first interaction with this what are your memories of the pacific theater from an na education standpoint specifically public education and if you know if it does match that a lot of this history was in fact glossed over what are your thoughts on uh history being a playbook so to speak being the cheat sheet that if you know how history goes you know how to not do crap in the future right let me know in the comment section down below thank you everyone for watching as always and i will see you all in the next one